Black Panther is a title and mantle given to Wakanda's king and most often greatest warrior. The Black Panther is also Wakanda's religious leader and commander-in-chief. The title may seem to be hereditary, but it can be challenged by any citizen for the right to rule in a ritual combat ceremony. The mantle has been carried by many, and in this video we will be talking about the chronological order and ascension of each individual to carry this title. Who the first was to carry the mantle of Black Panther can be a controversial topic between the 1 million BC Black Panther and Bashanga. To learn more about the controversial topic of the first to have this title, check out this other video on our channel. For the purposes of this video, we will be basing our order off of Marvel's Black Panther family tree, and those in Earth-616, the mainstream continuity in the Marvel multiverse. Around 10,000 years ago, a meteorite of vibranium crashed into Wakanda, changing their way of life forever. Bashenga led the investigation on the crashed meteor, believing that it was a gift from the gods. Upon the discovery of the vibranium, ideas of using the new metal to forge weapons flooded their minds. Unfortunately, the meteorite gave off radiation, causing some of the people to be turned into demon spirits. Bashenga prayed to the panther goddess to give him the strength to beat the demons. Bashenga then took the mantle of Black Panther and closed the vibranium mound to the world. He then formed a group known as the Panther Cult, which was to protect the vibranium and to keep the demon spirits from spreading throughout the nation. There are many who ruled after Bashenga, but the first that we know about is simply known as the 19th century Black Panther, whose real name is unknown. We get a flashback of this Black Panther as outsiders came to invade the supposedly poor and undeveloped country of Wakanda, but they were severely outmatched by the technology of Wakanda. This sent fear into the invaders' hearts as they quickly retreated. The next in line that we know about is Azuri, who is also known as Azuri the Wise. Azuri was the Black Panther during World War II and may have been one of the most ruthless Black Panthers. During World War II, he started hunting and decapitating every Nazi that would enter his kingdom. So many Nazi soldiers were killed that they believed that the Wakandans were hunting them down like it was a sport. The Germans had come in search of vibranium in Wakanda to be able to build missiles to gain an advantage in the war. Captain America was sent to Wakanda to figure out why the Germans were sending so many men there. When Captain America arrived at Wakanda, he was surprised to see the decapitated heads of Nazis on spikes, and was then confronted by Azuri the Wise. The Black Panther assured Captain America that there was no need for Americans in Wakanda, and that he would take no part in their war with the Germans. This enraged Captain America, and once he laid a hand on the King of Wakanda, Azuri had enough and the two began to fight. The King tried to teach Cap a lesson, while Captain America was just amazed at the skills that Azuri possessed. The two would go on to become friends after their confrontation, and gain their mutual respect for one another as they took on the Nazi threat together. Azuri was married to Nanali, and would go on to have two sons, the oldest being T'Chaka and the youngest being Siyan. From a young age, T'Chaka began to develop the skills necessary to be an effective warrior and believed in preserving Wakanda's heritage by honoring the old ways even with the advancements of technology. A young T'Chaka was even alongside his father Azuri when Captain America visited Wakanda during World War II. After the passing of Azuri, T'Chaka would take on the mantle of the Black Panther. During his reign, T'Chaka was interested in how he could further advance Wakanda and their technology. His wife, Niami, was also a big contributor in T'Chaka's goals for technology advancement. Eventually, in order to see how the outside world's technology could help Niami come up with new ideas, she left Wakanda. During her time away, she found scientific uses for vibranium that would help Wakanda. Niami was so focused on her discoveries that she became reluctant to bear children and kept prolonging bearing an heir to follow T'Chaka. Eventually, she put her work on hold and became pregnant with the future of Wakanda. Niami became ill while she was pregnant and unfortunately lost her life a week after giving birth to their first son, T'Challa. T'Chaka had a hard time with the passing of the love of his life. It bothered him for weeks, months, and even years. The only joy that he could find was in his young prince T'Challa. At the age of five, T'Challa began his training and excelled. At one point, when under the supervision of the Dora Milaje, T'Challa went missing in the woods and was found by a woman named Ramonda. T'Chaka was so grateful that she had found his son that he invited her to the capital of Wakanda. This began to invite love back into T'Chaka's heart and he would go on to remarry Ramonda and bring a little girl into their life named Shuri. Ramonda would become the mother figure for T'Challa throughout his life. As all kings rise to power, there is always a fall to their demise. Unfortunately for T'Chaka, his reign as king came to an end at the hand of a Dutch scientist named Ulysses Claw. Claw came to Wakanda with his mercenaries wanting to mine vibranium. 
When T'Chaka declined their proposal, Claw and his men opened fire with their sonic weapons. Claw and his sonic weapons were too much for T'Chaka, and when Claw took a shot to kill the young Prince T'Challa, King T'Chaka jumped in front of him, sacrificing himself for his son. After the shot was fired, a spear impaled Claw's arm, causing him to drop the sonic weapon. The young prince had taken action and attacked Claw, causing him to retreat with his men. With King T'Chaka's demise, young T'Challa was not yet ready to lead the people of Wakanda. Sian, the younger brother of the fallen king, was to take T'Chaka's place till the young prince was older and ready for the throne. Sian never had any intention to rule Wakanda, but was left with no other choice. His reign, however, was not very long-lived, as one day a year the Black Panther was put through a series of trials and could be challenged for the throne. Sian was put through his yearly challenges, facing many men. There seemed to be no competition for the Black Panther at all, but others still fought in hopes of coming out victorious. Sian seemed to have everything under control, but when a man with a mask jumped into the arena, it became a fight worth watching. The attention of the others was quickly drawn to the man in the mask as he was holding his own with the Black Panther. The two would go back and forth, each delivering devastating blows. The man in the mask even began to gain the upper hand and looked as if he was going to dethrone the king. When the man took off his mask, it was none other than T'Challa, who was challenging his uncle two years earlier than expected. He was now ready to take his place as the Black Panther. Sian was happy to see that it was T'Challa under the mask and knew that Wakanda was in good hands. Sian was also a close advisor to T'Challa, just as he was for his brother T'Chaka. T'Challa is the most well-known when it comes to the title of Black Panther. Being the king of Wakanda wasn't an easy feat and it came with its own challenges. One of T'Challa's complications as king of Wakanda was that of Eric Killmonger, who was also known as N'Jadaka. When Claw and his mercenaries attacked Wakanda, he and his accomplice N'Jobu were banished, along with their families. This left Killmonger full of rage and hate towards T'Challa. As time went on and under the reign of T'Challa, Killmonger was repatriated back to Wakanda. Eric took his chances and decided to challenge T'Challa for the throne in royal combat. At Warrior Falls, the two began to battle it out, both landing significant punches on one another. It was the fight of the century as the two battled out for hours upon hours, even stopping at times to take water and lunch breaks. The two fighters would not yield to one another, and so they continued their fight. Just as it seemed that the two were equal in combat, T'Challa became distracted for a split second, and Killmonger took advantage of the opportunity, landing another significant blow. While down for the count, Killmonger jumped on T'Challa, putting him in a coma and hanging on for life. In order to win the ritual combat, one must yield to the other or win by killing his opponent. In this case, T'Challa was not yet dead, but had not yielded either. Agent Ross, who was a US State Department agent and worked with T'Challa, was to be in charge of Wakanda in the absence of the king. Agent Ross yielded to save what little life T'Challa was holding on to. Eric Killmonger had now legitimately defeated the Black Panther. T'Challa was very fortunate that Agent Ross was there to yield to save his life. Not only was his life spared, but Moon Knight and a man named Jericho Drum, who was also known as Dr. Voodoo, were able to mystically bring T'Challa back to his health, bringing him out of his coma. T'Challa began to physically regain his strength as he worked hard at physical therapy. While T'Challa was in his coma, Eric had not performed all the required steps to his ascension to become the Black Panther and ruler of Wakanda. He only had the title. Killmonger had only defeated T'Challa in ritual combat, but had not performed all of his tasks. Killmonger was challenged to fight six of Wakanda's fiercest warriors along with other trials. This was simply sparring practice for Killmonger as he beat each of the warriors. At last, Eric was ready to eat the heart-shaped herb that would grant him the powers of the Black Panther. As he partook of the heart-shaped herb, he fell on the ground because his body reacted to the herb because he was not of royal lineage. This put Killmonger into a coma and T'Challa resumed his role as the Black Panther, as he was the only logical heir to the throne since he had previously been the Black Panther. Later in T'Challa's rule, Namor invited him to his estate to talk about becoming future allies and to see where Wakanda would stand in world matters. Namor had accepted an alliance with Norman Osborn, who T'Challa felt was a crazy madman. Not only had he aligned himself with Norman Osborn, but the rest of his allies were Doctor Doom, Loki, Emma Frost, and Hood. T'Challa knew that a group like this would be unstable and dangerous. T'Challa politely declined Namor's offer and made his way back to his ship when he was confronted by Doctor Doom and his robots. It was evident now that he was set up and that this was an ambush. T'Challa and the Dora Milaje fought off Doctor Doom and his robots and made their way back to the ship to ensure T'Challa's safety. 
As one of the Dora Milaje beat down Doctor Doom, she realized that she had only beaten a Doctor Doom bot and that it was not the real Doctor Doom, making this even more of a trap than they had thought. As the door opened to the ship, the real Doctor Doom was there and hit T'Challa with an energy blast, leaving him singed. One of the Dora Milaje sisters urged the others to take T'Challa back to Wakanda as she ran to stall Doctor Doom. When she went to take on Doctor Doom, he grabbed her by the throat and ensured that she would not die quickly. To his surprise, the Dora Milaje hit a button, which was a trigger to an explosive. She gave her life to take out Doctor Doom and to provide T'Challa the time that he needed to make it out with the ship. She succeeded in giving T'Challa enough time to make it out with the other Dora Milaje, but Doctor Doom took the blast almost as if he was unaffected. T'Challa made his way back to Wakanda, but the ship was badly damaged, and upon arrival in Wakanda, the ship crashed to the ground. T'Challa was taken to a medical facility and was treated. T'Challa was again put into a coma, and it was evident that the people of Wakanda needed a Black Panther to lead and protect them from an invasion from those who had attacked T'Challa. T'Challa's half-sister Shuri was then trained to become the new Black Panther. When T'Challa woke from his coma, he officially passed on the mantle of Black Panther to his sister so that he could recover from his injuries. T'Challa lost his powers that came from being the Black Panther, but was able to work with a sorcerer named Zawavari. While working with Zawavari, T'Challa was able to make a pact with another panther deity. This allowed him to have his abilities and powers restored with new additions to make him more resistant to mystical attacks. There were now two beings at the same time with the powers and abilities of the Black Panther. As an honorable mention, and to round off this list of all of those who held the Black Panther title, at one point, T'Challa called upon the previous Black Panther's warriors and priests to counsel with him on the future of Wakanda. In the form of a ghost, we see another Black Panther named Mamadu that had not been previously mentioned in the comics. This is the only time that we hear of Mamadu in the comics. And with Mamadu, we conclude our list of Black Panthers. Let us know in the comments below which of these characters you think was the most interesting Black Panther, or just who was your favorite. Thanks as always for watching this video, and if you enjoyed any part of it, feel free to leave a like below and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, have a marvelous day.